So we're starting a new series today, like Sean was saying, Radical Receiving. And this was based off of a word that the Lord gave us. Uh, and really, he said that the Rock of Roseville is entering into a three-month window of radical receiving. So we're entering into this three-month window, we believe, as we're following the Lord as he's speaking, that us as a community and a body are entering into this three-month period where the Lord's about to radically pour out and he's calling us to radically receive. I talked a little bit just briefly last week about what that looks like and what that means, but I'm going to sort of set the table and talk about a few preliminary things um, as we head into this season. So if you have your Bibles, um, I'm going to be jumping around all over the place, uh, but start in Isaiah 54. Because when I was talking to the Lord about, you know, what does this look like? There's this verse, Isaiah 54, verse 2 in particular. I'm going to read it and then I'll pray and I'll just kind of launch in. It says, enlarge the sight of your tent and let your tent curtains be stretched out. Do not hold back, lengthen your ropes and drive your pegs deep. For you will, in verse three, for you will spread out to the right and to the left and your descendants will dispossess nations and inhabit the desolate cities. So Father, we thank you um, for the season that we believe you're leading the Rock of Roseville into. Um, I pray for this word today. God, guide my mouth, guide this ministry time. Um, just make our hearts soft. In Jesus' name, amen. So most of us have a concept of what receiving is, right? We love receiving gifts. We're coming up on Christmas. Uh, I am a father of young children, so my brain is very much in the what is going to be on sale uh, come Black Friday. We know what it is to receive to some extent, but then the Lord specifically used the phrase radical receiving. He used that word radical. And so when I looked up that definition, radical means relating to or affecting the fundamental nature of something. That's relating to or affecting the fundamental nature of something. So when we talk about the Lord wanting us to radically receive, we're talking about him wanting to pour things out that actually shifts, shapes, and affects how we live our day-to-day -day lives. Are you tracking with me? And here's when I look at the entire council of scripture, when I look at the different stories of God's people throughout the entire arc of the Bible, very frequently when God's about to make a massive shift, taking his people from one spot to another, he has them sit down, shift and rearrange their lives so that, that he can pour something out, they can receive it, that's going to actually shape how they move forward from that point on. If you think about Israel as they left Egypt and were getting ready to go to the promised land, God said, it's not just that I want you to leave one place and go to another. He says, I actually need you to go back to take Israel back to this mountain Moses where I met with you and I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments. He's saying, I'm going to actually pour out for you a new way of doing life because you've lived your lives as slaves for hundreds of years and now I need you to receive instruction from me that's going to govern and shape and shift how you've been living life so that you can actually be the type of people that can possess the land that I'm taking you into. Moving forward, similarly, when we're transitioning from the old covenant into the new covenant, after Jesus rises from the dead, he comes back, he talks to his disciples, he says, Go back into the city and wait until you've been given power from on high. He says, wait until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. They go, they, to use this prophetic imagery, they expand the borders of their tents. They expand their tent pegs by saying, God, we realize that you want to pour something out. We're obeying what you told us to do before you ascended to be with the Father. So we're here waiting. We don't know what it is we're waiting for exactly or what it's going to feel like, what it's going to look like, but we're waiting the Holy Spirit gets poured out and the church is birthed on that day. And the, the operation and the filling of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life represents a radical change in how the people of God lived from that day forward. 
you have to think about this. And again, because we live in this day and age on this side of the covenant, we don't know what it is to follow Jesus without the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We don't know what it is to follow God without the Holy Spirit living inside of us. But for a long portion of human history, people obeying the law was without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit actually being poured out represents a radical, radical shift in how life is lived. So in each of these instances, they had to, and again, I'm using Isaiah 54 as sort of a prophetic symbol. What, what Isaiah is prophesying in that moment, uh, just to read verse one to give you a little more context. He says, rejoice childless one who did not give birth. Burst into song and shout for you who have not been in labor for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. So at that point, he then says, expand the boundaries of your tent. He's basically saying that addition that you wanted on your house, you're going to need it because you're about to have so many kids, even though you've been barren for years. Expand because I'm about to fill it. But receiving radically, like I've just been talking about, receiving radically, even the way this verse talks about, means that the Lord is actually asking us to shift, if not for a season of time, maybe for longer, how we do life so that we can position ourselves to better receive what he's doing. And I'm going to talk about a few different aspects of it. I'm going to, again, go through a bunch of places in the New Testament, talk about a few different things. But to sort of encapsulate it, there's two things that can drastically affect what we receive from the Lord and how we receive. One is your expectation. Everybody say expectation. expectation. Then the other is double-mindedness. Say double-mindedness. So I'm going to be talking about expectation and double-mindedness. Again, if you have your Bibles, uh, if you can go to Matthew chapter 10, this is going to be in verse 41. Jesus is in Matthew chapter 10. He's talking to his disciples. He's giving them instructions for how to do mission because he's just sending them out. And he says, this is how you're going to go. You're going to talk about the gospel of the kingdom. So I'm going to actually start in verse 40. The one who welcomes you welcomes me. And the one who welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. Anyone who welcomes a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who welcomes a righteous person because he's righteous will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is a disciple, truly I tell you, he will never lose his reward. So in Matthew 10, Jesus, again, this is in the context of him giving his disciples specific instructions about how to do mission. They're about to go out from town to town. Basically, they've been following Jesus, watching him go around, talk about the kingdom, perform miracles. Now Jesus is saying, you know, okay, I'm kicking you out of the nest. It's your turn. You get to go do this now. And he's giving them context for, you know, he's preparing them. Some people are not going to receive you, but those who do, this is what it looks like. And he get, even uses these specific phrases. Whoever receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever receives a righteous person and because he is righteous will receive a righteous person's reward. So there's something in terms of expectation, the way that you look at value and receive somebody who has something to give you has an effect on what you receive from them. To put it another way, and this is actually demonstrated more so in Matthew chapter 6, so I'll just turn over there. Sorry, Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6 but specifically starting in verse four. So I'll just do verses four through six. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown 
among his relatives and in his household. He was not able to do a miracle there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. He was going around the villages teaching. So this even drills down a little bit deeper on this concept that the way this works in the kingdom is if you honor somebody to a certain degree, the level to which you're honoring them has an effect on what you receive. And Jesus' life gives us a much clearer picture of this. Jesus goes to his hometown. These people grew up around him. They knew who he was. They knew who his brothers and sisters were. They knew his mom and dad. They watched him grow up. And now here comes Jesus saying that he is basically, not basically, saying he is the Messiah that they've been waiting for and he's performing miracles. And they've heard the stories of what started to happen. But the only thing that can go through their heads is we watch this kid's diapers get changed. What do you mean he's coming around teaching and performing miracles? And then the next verse that gets talked about, it says that he was not able to perform many miracles there because of their unbelief, which tells us two things. Number one, it tells us that Jesus wanted to perform many miracles there. And number two, it tells us that our, again, our honor towards people who are sent by God to give things to us, sent into our lives, to teach us things, the way that we honor them, the way that we view them, dictates to a certain degree what we can receive from them. Now we're getting into some nuanced territory, and I know that uh, there's this prevailing way of looking at the Lord's intervention in human lives, particularly as it relates to physical healing and the miraculous, that goes something like this. Tell me if you've heard this. If God wants to heal me, he knows where to find me. And this starts to get us into this topic about double-mindedness. And I'll make this connection for you in a minute, but God desires partnership way more than we understand. Because basically what we, what we do when we talk like that, if God wants to heal me, he knows where to find me. What we're essentially doing is saying, I, I'm going to assent mentally. I'm going to you know, initial next to this theological truth that says God is all powerful and he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. We'll sign our initials to that so that we can basically both mentally and emotionally give ourselves space to say, but I'm not going to expect that because I'm afraid of what disappointment will feel like. Because there's a couple of ways you can go about this. You can say, I believe God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. I believe he's a healer. So I'm going to lean into him and keep asking, seeking, knocking. God, I need healing. We need breakthrough in this situation. Or you can say, I believe God can and will do whatever he wants. So I'm just going to go sit in the corner and wait until he does something. Both exist under the umbrella of saying, I believe God is all powerful and he can do whatever he wants. But those are two drastically different ways of living that I would propose to you see drastically different results. And again, I understand that I'm knocking on the door of mystery here. Don't hear what I'm not saying, because what I'm not saying is this other, if I'm going to talk about the other ditch that people fall into, what I'm not saying is if you didn't get healed, you just didn't believe enough. Because quite frankly, I've seen that, I've seen that way of thinking used in an abusive way that puts pressure on the person receiving prayer rather than saying like clearly there's something that we're missing here god what what are you doing what am i missing and it's usually that way of thinking is usually taken by the person who's doing the the ministry and it's forced on to the person receiving prayer because the person who's praying is really uncomfortable with the fact that nothing's moving And they don't want to feel that, so they shift that off onto the other person. 
the option C that I would propose to you is what if we both went, okay, God, clearly this isn't working. I know that your word says that we're supposed to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse lepers. There's stuff I'm not understanding here. What are we not understanding? And you keep asking, seeking, and knocking. Even from my own life, I wasn't going to spend as much time on this, but here we are. Just so that you know, I'm not blowing steam right now. Um, I have lost a very close friend, and this, that was several years ago, and then this last year, I've lost my grandfather both to cancer. I will not stop praying for the sick. I don't have answers. I don't have understanding yet on why things happen the way that they did. Because even though I've lost those two, two people, I have prayed for people who have had cancer and I've seen them recover. I was working at Radio Shack. How many of you guys remember what a Radio Shack is? <laughs> And my boss at the time, she had gotten pregnant. She had a history of ovarian cancer. She had beaten it multiple times, but she had gotten pregnant. And then the doctor said, hey, we found tumors on your ovaries. She said, I'm not gonna do treatment because I'm not gonna kill this baby as a part of the radiation. And so I, you know, just after our shift one day, I just pray for her. I didn't feel anything crazy. It didn't seem anything over the top. You know, an angel didn't appear. She didn't fall out in the parking lot. Like none of that happened, but she goes on maternity leave, delivers her baby, and after she comes back, she says, oh, I wanted to tell you, by the way, like the doctors did their scans again and there's no more tumors on my ovaries. So there's a, there's a tension that exists there between I've seen God do this before, and also I've lost people and I don't understand, but I'm not going to let my disappointment from those things happening and me not understanding say, I am not going to push and war for healing and for breakthrough. So again, the, the way that you receive the people God has put in your life. Scripture says it, elsewhere in one of the epistles, we, we no longer regard anyone according to the flesh. Which means that you actually don't have, in the kingdom, you don't have permission to view people through the lens of all of their sins. Thank God Jesus doesn't look at us that way. So another way to say what I'm talking about is God is regularly pouring out, but do we miss receiving what he wants to give because we don't like the package that it came in? Having little kids will humble you quick. Especially when, especially when they'll like pipe up and say something that lets you know that they've actually been paying attention when you've been trying to teach them. Like, I'll be short with one of my kids or I'll be short with Amanda or something like that. And Jacob will come back and say like, dad, that wasn't kind or things like that. And I'm like, you're right. It wasn't. So I can receive that correction, even though it's coming through the mouth of my son, who I'm still responsible for, or I have the option to write it off because I'm like, you're a kid, you don't know what you're talking about. Clearly he knows what he's talking about. So again, in talking about this dissonance that can occur between I can, in my mind, agree to a particular truth. I can say, God is a healer. He does heal. Again, I, I pray for the sick a lot, so this is just sort of where my brain is. This can apply to a bunch of different areas. But the way that I live my life, 
can actually look different. I can say, yeah, I believe God's a healer. I believe he heals. But if I never lay hands on a sick person, what does that tell me about what you actually believe? So if we go to James, James chapter one, verses five through eight, James talks about this person who's double-minded, who's unstable in all their ways. And that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord is what he says. The context specifically, he's asking, he's saying, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally, and then he'll give you wisdom. Then he zooms out a little bit and broadens it and says, but for those of you who are double-minded, you shouldn't expect to receive anything. So what's one of the ways that double-mindedness plays out? It's what I just talked about. The, the Western way of thinking about belief and truth and all of those things looks very much like if I can say that I logically agree to a statement, then that means that I believe it. And that's true up until a point. The, the more Eastern way, which again, in case you didn't know, that Christianity is an Eastern religion, we worship a Jewish man who said that he's the son of God and was crucified, died, was buried, rose again on the third day. The, their way of looking at this, and even, again, I'm a Bible nerd, so you get Bible nerd tidbits for free. There's this prayer that you find uh, in the Old Testament called the Shema, which any good Jew is going to be praying regularly. It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Their idea of that word hear actually doesn't just encompass listening. It encompasses obedience too. So when we look through the history of Israel, again, they're saying, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Part of what comes with that statement is monotheism. You worship Yahweh. You do not worship anybody else. But if we look at the history of Israel, they did not hear that he was one God. Again, we did a series on the book of Judges some time ago. That whole cycle kept happening because they refused to hear that he was one God. Similarly, we can say we believe that God is a healer. We can say that we believe that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But the way that our soul thinks, acts, operates, the way that we actually move through life can communicate that we actually believe something very different. One that I see play out often. Again, I teach on the prophetic at different points. Um, it's something that I've done for a number of years. So a lot of times what I'll see in that context is people will come and say like, man, I just, I've been trying to hear God for such a long time. I really want to do this. I want to operate in the prophetic. I want to hear him. I want to hear his voice. I want to be able to bless people that way. And they say, and, and I believe all the right stuff. I believe God speaks. I believe he wants to speak to his kids. I believe that this is something that we can all operate in because we're under the new covenant and we all have the Holy Spirit. So they're telling me the list of all these things that they believe correctly. And they're like, but I, whenever I sit and try to listen to the Lord, I, I get nothing. Oftentimes, if you dig a little bit deeper with those people, they live their lives in such a way, believing that they're under condemnation. They live life feeling ashamed of themselves, feeling like they need to work harder. They look at people who God uses in the gifts and they have this imbalanced view of them, thinking like they must have something together that I don't. And so I, I talk to them and I'm like, well, there's your problem. You're not actually wanting, number one, the way that you actually feel and live your life tells me that you don't really, you believe God speaks to other people, but you don't believe he wants to speak to you is number one. And then number two, you're not actually looking for him to speak to you so that you can learn how to move in the prophetic. You're looking for him to speak to you because you need a stamp of approval because you feel like he doesn't approve of you. 
when the truth is there's three nails and a cross that says he does. And so oftentimes those beliefs that we have that don't line up with scripture and that dissonance, that double mindedness that we have, oftentimes we'll go back to, we had a negative experience. We had an emotion around that experience and we formed an internal belief based off of that. Um, for example, if you, this is just an easier one to point to, if you, and to keep it within the realm of learning how to hear the voice of God, if your father growing up was verbally abusive and you grew up under that, hearing God called father, you can say and mentally assent to, I believe God is good. I believe he has good things to say. I believe that he has like his best in mind for me and that he's a good dad. I can mentally have all the reasons why I should believe that. But if in my heart, I have not resolved the tension between God, you say you're a father, but the father I grew up with was a jerk. If you don't resolve that tension, you can come forward and say like, God, I'm ready to receive. And internally, you're just flinching the whole time being like, please don't say anything. Because all I know how all I know about how a father sounds is mean. All I know about how a father sounds is condemning. All I know about how a father sounds is that he speaks death over his kids. But I'm here because I, I know that I'm supposed to be. And let me be also very clear. God still meets us in the middle of our mess and in the middle of us trying to figure it out. Yeah. Don't hear what I'm saying through the lens of legalism that says you have to have all of your T's crossed and your I's dotted before God can show up, because that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that as we're entering into a period where the Lord's asking us to radically receive, don't be surprised when he starts knocking on the door of some things that might feel painful for you to address with him. One of the ways we clear out space to receive is when we actually allow the Lord to clear out the dead brush of lies, death, destruction, all that stuff that we've allowed to just sit in our souls for decades sometimes. And in him clearing out that space, that's where we make the room for him to start speaking and start to receive what he wants to give us. Just a couple more thoughts for you along the same line, and then I'll close. But how many of you guys, and again, I asked this question last week, how many of you guys have been given a really, like, insanely generous gift before? How many of you, it made you incredibly uncomfortable? So that is also that double-mindedness thing that I'm talking about. Do we believe God is generous? Yes. Do we believe that God uses his people to bless his people? So if I can mentally assent to those things, why does it make me so uncomfortable when that's exactly what he's trying to do in those situations? Oftentimes it's because we have this deep, we've got one of two lies usually. That, that are just deeply set into our soul and how we think and how we operate. One of those is, I am not worthy of good things. Again, th just to attack that for a second. Who gets to decide how much something is worth? The person who made the thing. He looked at you and, you, you and he decided that you were worth taking on flesh, living for 33 years, a sinless life, 
going through the most, to this day, the most agonizing death that humanity has ever invented. Suffering that, suffering betrayal, suffering rejection. He saw that, knew that was coming, looked at you and said, you are worth me walking through that. So if we're talking about unworthiness, which if we really dig down further into that is just a deep set shame. Anytime we're partnering with that thing, we're partnering with a lie. And asking Holy Spirit to help us say like, God, where did that come from? When did I start to agree with that? How do I practically break agreement with that? Because it's really good and it's important and it's necessary that we pray through those things, but also you have to shift how you actually live your life. You have to shift how you come to the Lord. You have to shift how you come to other people. So that's the one lie that we can deal with when we feel that, like when somebody wants to give us something we feel incredibly uncomfortable, there's that deep set sense of unworthiness. And this comes from a similar place, this number two, it comes from a similar place, but it's slightly different. Um, some of us grew up being told and believing that you can only have something if you, and I'm gonna be hyperbolic, you can only have something if you worked your fingers to the bone to get it. which there's a part of that which is good work ethic, so don't hear what I'm not saying. Be responsible, learn how to work, learn how to provide, learn how to contribute, all of those things. And, and you worship, love, and follow a generous God. It's one thing for us to come to him and ask for things and receive things when we've tried everything and now we're still coming up zeros. What are you going to do when you're in a season of blessing already? God's pouring out, God's providing for you, and then he wants to pour out more on top of that. Most of us, that sounds really good. I've been in a couple of situations like that. It's really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> all of this we're talking about radical receiving the Lord's going to start knocking on the doors of some long held beliefs some long held soul patterns if you can understand what I mean when I call it that that's a, that's a way of you thinking feeling processing life that doesn't line up with the truth of God's word what he says about you, what's true about you. He's going to start knocking on the door of those things and radically receiving. Ultimately, if I'm going to make a stronger point through all of this, radically receiving requires radical humility. It requires us coming to him and saying, God, you have something that you want to give me. You have something that I need that I have no way of getting for myself. And I need help. And God, I believe even you want to take me from this place to another place. I can't do that on my own. I need to humble myself and say, God, I need you to come through here. Would you all stand with me? We're going to pray. I'm going to say this to something that I, I spend a lot of time thinking about, um, particularly since COVID. Um, there's this verse where Paul says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Most of us stop there, but that's only 50% of the verse. The other half is, and the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Aaron, what are you talking about receiving? I don't know if I want to receive if you're going this direction with it. Just hold on. 
if you follow the early arc of Jesus's ministry, right after he gets baptized, it says he was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He goes through his temptation. Most of us know that story. The last bit, just before he starts his ministry, that I think we miss, is it says he left in the power of the Spirit. He was led by the Holy Spirit into the season where he was tempted, where he was tested, where he was tried. And then it says he left in the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of us are sitting on words where God said, you know, this is how I'm going to use you. This is what I'm going to do in your life. You've walked through seasons of testing. You've walked through hard patches. You've walked through seasons where you felt like you were dying on the inside. And you're saying, God, I don't know where you are or what's going on. Part of what I think radical receiving is for those of you who identify with that is don't pull yourself out of the game just before he's about to pour out what you've been walking with him into. Even going back to Isaiah, full circle, Isaiah's prophesying to Israel like she's a woman who has been barren her whole life, and now he's coming to her and he's saying, not only are you going to have kids, you're going to have so many kids that you need an addition on your house. Some of what God's calling us to do in radically receiving is actually reviving hope that we left behind. And that, if you look at the whole arc of scripture, that's the kind of faith we're called to. You want to talk about not being double-minded? It's going back to what did God say? What did he say in his word? What did he speak to us and confirm through community? What did he say? And going back to that thing, you got to think there was a couple decades between when Abraham got the promise of a son and when the promised son was actually born. We want to be faithful people. We want to receive the promise. Some of you need to revive hope in something that you have given up hope on. I understand the disappointment. Believe me, I understand the disappointment. Believe me, I understand. God said, go here, do this. This is what I'm going to do. You follow, you obey. And then it feels like he put you on a left turn. And it's like, where did you go, God? I will say there's one verse, this response that the apostles had to Jesus after he gave his eat my flesh, drink my blood sermon. This way of thinking and even taking this verse as a prayer is what can help pull you out of that disappointment and fear of disappointment that will actually help you to be in a position to receive and partner with God over what he said he was going to do. Jesus gives this sermon. He says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Everybody gets offended and leaves. There were thousands of people. He turns to his disciples and says, are you going to leave me too? And here's the response. And this is what will, this is what will help you. And this is what helped me. They say, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy one of God. That thing that will keep you in the game, that will help you step out of that disappointment, help you step back in and say, God, there's some dead brush that needs to get cleared up so I can receive what you want to give me. Is saying, God, I do not understand what you're doing right now. I do not understand the events that led me here. I don't understand even fully what you want to pour out, but I believe that we're following you and that you want us to receive something. God, I've just seen too much at this point. I could choose to get all offended and upset about what didn't happen, what I felt like he didn't do, what I believed he should have done, all of this stuff. But at the end of the day, I've seen him do too much. I've seen him come through too many times. 
I've seen him be true to his word too many times to allow my offense at what I believed he should have done but didn't do pull me out. I don't understand, and that's okay. As a matter of fact, the belief that you have a right to understand what God's doing all the time is called entitlement, and that needs to die. So I'm going to pray for us. (laughs) I need it. So just put a hand on your heart for me. Holy Spirit, we just uh, invite you to search us, know us, and see if there's any wicked thing in us. Um, Father, we want to be a people who, as we're step following you, stepping into this season where we believe you want to pour out and you want us to receive. God, we ask that you would reveal to us the, those dead things that need to get pulled out. God, would you reveal to us and speak clearly through your word, through friendships, through your spirit inside of us, would you speak clearly to us about where are we not in alignment? Where are we double-minded? So that we can allow you to speak truth to those areas and actually heal those disappointments and heal those things inside of us. God, because we recognize that we need you. You have every good thing that we need. We believe that you're a good father who wants to pour out. So teach us how to receive. God, break down these false ideas of unworthiness that actually, in some ways, are built on on false humility. Jesus, that you would tear those things down. Everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, would you tear it down in our hearts, in our lives, in this season? And Father, would you bring breakthrough in our hearts, even as we believe you're getting ready to pour things out? We love you, God. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.